Okay, we are in evangelism. This is the evangelism class. We, we're actually going to be uh, in lesson number two. So we'll just uh, take a glance at where we have been and where we are going to go. So number one was the answer to the church's task. We talked about that last week. And that broke down this way. But this, uh, this week we're in motives. It's just lesson number two, the motives for evangelism. And I want you to notice how we have it arranged here. It is motives from above, that would be God. Motives from within, that's within us. And motives from around us. That is, we're in a lot of competition here, as you very well know, in our country. So we'll think about motives from above, motives from within, and motives from around. So in thinking about the text, let's just a glance at the, of course, the primary texts about, these te uh, about this uh, topic, and that would be, of course, Matthew 28, and then Matthew 11. We'll also look at Ephesians 1, and we'll think about uh, these passages. Of course, these are familiar to all of us, but we'll just glance at them very quickly to note the Great Commission, which, of course, is given to all of us, and that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. And, of course, in Matthew 28, is teach all nations, and then we're told in verse, uh, this is uh, verse 19, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Two things here to note, and that is number one, there is evangelism, which is our task, and that is teaching the lost and baptizing them into Christ, but also it has continuing to teach them to observe all things. So on both, both fronts here, we are, we are met with uh, much uh, lackadaisical preaching to the lost and teaching ourselves, and that's, but, but, but that's our task, both of them. So that's, all of it is included right here. But of course, this is the marching orders of Christians. And the same thing in Matthew, or the Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> but let's look at this passage in Matthew 11 for a moment. This one, of course, is familiar to you as well. I think it's one of my favorites, actually, of our Lord's invitation texts regarding inviting people to Him. This is 11 and 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Here we have uh, the very fact in, embedded in it is that we have to learn of Him and we have to learn Christ. And so that's our goal here. That's our goal elsewhere. Really, this is our primary goal as Christians, not only to edify one another, saw that in Matthew 28, but also evangelism. So if we were going to divide the work of the church up into different areas, what would the areas be? What is the work of the church? What is our, what is our work designed to do? There are different areas of it. So what do we, how do we normally divide it up, thinking about it? Okay, so <clears throat> let's, okay, so she has, uh, Nita mentioned worship and education. So let's, uh, let's include, of course, number one, evangelism, that is teaching the lost, then we have worship. So we normally classify that under, under what? How do we classify that? Evangelism and edification. Edification, edify. What does edification mean? Build up. How do we build up? How do you build something up? Say again. Supporting other people. How do we support one another in this community? How do we edify one another. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's where it begins, our attitude. You know, edification takes on the, the color of education. That is teaching. And that's the reason I say that is because of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, in which Paul outlines a worship service. This is what Nita had mentioned, worship. Worship and the purpose of it is to edify, not only to worship and praise God, but it is to edify one another. 
So let all things be done unto edifying, that is, teaching one another, that would be building one another up. And so we're, we're interested in one another. It's a one another religion, isn't it? This is what this is all about. So we, t we say, okay, evangelism. Then we have edification. That was kind of the generic category, which includes worship. It includes teaching. It includes what's going on now. As we teach one another, it's not me teaching you. We teach one another. And then we have one other area of the church in which uh, we should be interested, and we are involved in that also. What would that be? How do we normally put it? Benevolence. Benevolence. So what do we mean by that? Just helping people who are in trouble. That's right. Helping people who are in need. And so that's what, of course, the Saturday meals are about. That's what uh, visitation is all about. That's all, all of this is, all of it's benevolence. That is seen to other people and their needs. So we have evangelizing, which refers to the lost. Edification refers to ourselves, teaching and building up. And benevolence, seen to all. And that includes members of the church and non-members of the church. Isn't that, isn't that the way it should be? And that's, that's the role of the church. So where is it that we probably are the weakest in your estimation? Evangelism. Hobbes says right, right off, evangelism. How, you agree with him on that? I think I, think I actually feel that way. I mean, we are pretty good. Um, edification, that is worship, a teaching. Uh, we teach one another, and we are interested in building one another up in the faith. And also in benevolence, I think this congregation, at least in my thinking, is very, very diligent in benevolence and working and doing things for other people. But it is in evangelism that I think also that perhaps, uh, I guess perhaps I should say, not probably, but perhaps we are weakest. And I say that generically thinking about many congregations, weakest in evangelism, that is teaching the lost. So why is that the case? We'll come back to that in just a moment. So think about the reason that we need to do it. We have, we have a couple of things on here. For example, number one is the authority of Christ. That is, this is Christ's authority. <laughs> I, read, I read a book recently from, uh, by Ralph Gilmore. He is a professor at Fried Hardeman, and it's about pleasing God. And he says that this generation of Young people, they don't like the word authority. They don't like the idea of authority, and I, I suppose that's probably the case. They don't like authority, so he says we need to kind of, um, I don't know how to put it maybe, but he, he, he thinks maybe we need to tailor some of, our, some of our preaching to make it more like, okay, how do you please God, and how do, we, how do we know how to please God? That all may be true, but the bottom line is we're going to have to rely upon authority somewhere. It's not just this generation. That's the way it was when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. That's the way it was in the generation before. Every, every youth group, every youth group has the same thing. I don't like authority. Uh, so <clears throat> it's, not, it's just not a phenomenon that has occurred today. But bottom line, authority of Christ is, is right there in the, in the center of it. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, and so I hate to run from that concept because, well, we have a bunch of people who don't like authority. That may be the case, but that's to their detriment, really. So authority is number one. Let's glance at this passage, Ephesians chapter 1, for a moment. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Let's see, where did Ephesians go? There it is. <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> okay, which he wrought in Christ. This is speaking about, uh, he's speaking about having the eyes of your heart enlightened, verse 18. You might know the, what is the hope of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. And the, all of this he worked or wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. We normally utilize this passage to refer to the body of Christ. And speaking about the body, there's only one body, Ephesians 4 and 4, and Christ is the head of the church. 
But the reason that we're looking at it now is because, once again, the entire, the entire triumph of Christ is cast in terms of authority, far above dominion, but far above all rule, all of this. So I don't want us to be too shy about mashing on the concept of authority. And that's what this is all about. So the, that's the reason that we're evangelistic for the authority of Christ. And that's what he tells us. This is what you're going to do. When the bottom line, when we get, we get done with everything, because God said, do something, that's why we need to do it. And that goes back to his authority. Yes, sir. Right. So what, <clears throat> why should we pay attention to the authority of Scripture? Because it is God speaking to us. And when God speaks, that inherently has authoritative concept right there because, it's a, because it is God speaking. When God speaks, it is ours to listen. So it's all based upon authority. So I don't want to run too far from the concept of authority in spite of the fact that many young people today don't like that word at all. Let's think about also Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. You know that passage. Why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say, that I tell you to do? If we don't have authority, we actually lose the meaning of why call him Lord if we are not going to be submissive to his authority? And so also at sec, uh, or rather 2 Corinthians 5 as well as Revelation 3, Laodicea, remember the Laodicean church, he said, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. This is where a lot of people are today in the church, unfortunately, and that is lukewarm. So that is not paying attention to God's authority. Here's something else to think about. In spite of the fact that many young people today or the modern generation does not appreciate authority, the Bible does tell us with resounding clarity, and that is that at the last day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So whether they like it or not, that's what's going to take place. So it's best to do that now than at the very last day when it's too late if we have been unfaithful. So the authority of Christ, and that's what we're looking at. So let's think about from within. There are a couple of passages here that I want us to focus upon. One of them is in Galatians 2 and 20. And the other one that I like, and I'm going to use it also in my sermon uh, during the worship hour, would be 2 Kings chapter 6. So let's look at Galatians 2 and 20 for a moment. Here we have, a, this is, of course, we're looking at motivation from within. So what is, how's the passage, how's the passage read here? Someone read it out there. I am, okay. Christ lives in me. There is the, there is the within motivating factor. Christ is within us. Christ being within us means that we need to be evangelistic because that's how our Lord was. And he lives in us, and this is what he wants us to be. So now let's think about this example in 2 Kings chapter 6. So let's go to the Old Testament. You don't have your Old Testament with you. I don't either. So we'll just, um, there's some in the pew here. But this is, this is the days of Jehoram. The days are the divided kingdom of Israel. So the kingdom divided, remember, at the death of Solomon. Rehoboam takes the southern kingdom. Jeroboam takes the northern. And you know how the story uh, lines out. In the northern kingdom, the capital was in the city of what? The capital city of the northern kingdom was Samaria. 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 Yes, yeah, Samaria. Remember, Samaria was in the center of the country, but that was their capital. So uh, it's kind of fascinating. But Samaria, of course, been discovered. There's a big tell, what they call a tell mound. And the ruins of Samaria right there. And they found all kinds of uh, ivory inlaid pieces of furniture. We're told that that was how Ahab had built his kingdom. And so these are in the days uh, just following Ahab in the northern kingdom. And the king is Jehoram. The incident occurs when Ben-Hadad, the Syrian king, attacks Samaria and besieges it. What does besiege mean? What do I mean by besiege the city? Surround it and kind of choke it. They're going to choke it out. That's how, of course, much warfare still is conducted. That is, you choke the city out. You're going to, you're going to keep anything from coming in, provisions, and you're not going to let anybody out, right? 
That how, that's how they besiege a city. So they just, they trap a city and they just tighten it up and tighten it up. And pretty soon the people inside are starving and they're suing for peace and they're suing for surrender. And that's how they, that's how they do it. That would be, of course, a circumventing the fighting. So they trap the city. So that's what happened here. Jehoram is the king uh, from the line of um, Ahab. And so he's, uh, or I should say the northern kingdom, uh, the wicked king. So Jehoram is walking on the city walls one day, and uh, there is a woman who cries to him. What does she say? Do you remember what story how she cries to him about? She, they were eating their children. That's pretty dire straits. They had killed, killed the children. You know, you read all these stories in history about people who were in starvation, and they would take the soles of their shoes their leather, and they would boil them and so they can eat the soles of the shoes. That's just like, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine them being in such want like that. But they, in this case, they were killing the children. So Jehoram tore his clothes and he said, you know, I'm, he's, he's mad at Elisha. Why would he be mad at Elisha? Well, Elisha is the man of God. He's in the city and he thinks that Elisha, the man of God, should be able to have helped them and assist them in, out of this dire strait. So he says, I'm going to send my commander-in-chief to Elisha, send emissaries to Elisha. We're going to go get him. When the emissary, the commander-in-chief of the army, comes in with, with his retinue, comes into Elisha's house, Elisha says, and by the way, we're, we're told, as far as the dire straits are concerned, we're told also that an ass's head sold for, I think, was that maybe 80 shekels of silver. Is that right, 80? 80 shekels of silver. You buy, a, you buy a donkey's head for eight. That was an exorbitant amount of money for a donkey's head. That would be, of course, to eat the brains and eat, eat the whatever. That's how, they, that was how, how, how bad it was. And a, a cob of a dove's dung, which would be just, I think it would, I, I guess it would be to start a fire. I, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. Cost some a great big amount of money. I don't know what it was, but... Five shekels of silver. So that's a, that's a lot of money. That's more money than people make normally in a year or a month, five shekels. So, okay, so that's, that's where they are. So now they go to Elisha's house, and Elisha makes the prophecy. He says, tomorrow at this time, wheat and barley will be at, and I think he gives them a price of what the normal price would be. Just things are going to be back to normal with the price of wheat and barley. The commander-in-chief did not believe this at all. And he said, if God would open the windows of heaven, how can this possibly be? This is not, that's, no. His disbelief, so Elisha said what to him? You see that down that far, Hobbs, on there? Elisha told him, you'll see it with your eyes, but you will not participate in it at all. So that very afternoon and evening, there were four lepers outside the city, and they were outside the city because they couldn't be in the city, so they were starving to death as well. And the Syrians had left them alone because they had leprosy, so they thought, we're going to die if we stay out of here. Let's just go into the Syrian camp, and the worst they can do is kill us because we're about to die anyway. So they go into the Syrian camp after dark, and what do they find? The Syrians had all ran away because God had caused them to hear the sounds of chariots and an army marching with the battlements. And they thought the Egyptians have come to help the Israelites. And so they all ran and they left their utensils as they fled back to Syria, north by northeast, back to Syria. And all the tents were there. The encampment was there and the tables were there with all this food on it. And so these four lepers go in. <gasps> So they just start grabbing things, and you can imagine how they would be eating. They just stuff in their mouth. They're eating and eating, and one of them says, wait a minute. We're doing wrong. What do they need to do? Well, they need to give thanks to God. There's one other thing they need to do. Tell somebody else, if we stay here, then darkness will overtake us. Judgment will take us. We have good news. Let's go back and tell the people in the city. Get in, let's go back and tell them. They're dying in the city. And so they go back into the city and they tell them. 
Well, the king didn't believe it. He sent messengers out there. That's exactly the way it was. And so there was a mass stampede Jehoram had placed his commander-in-chief at the gate of the city to guard the gate. And as the people rushed out, he saw what was taking place, that they were, they were able to be filled with food, but they trampled him to death, and he did not participate in it at all. And so the lepers, they were the evangelists here. They said, we have great news. What, if, if we stay here and eat, then judgment will overtake us. That is, we, we need to tell somebody else about it. Now that's exactly the way, that's exactly the position we're in. We're like those four lepers, and we need to tell somebody about it. That's where we are. And if we don't, judgment will overtake us. Isn't that an interesting episode in 2 Kings 6? We stay right here, judgment will overtake us. So we are the four lepers. And it is ours to go and speak it to other people. We'll talk about some of this as we proceed in the class and thinking about how to deal with questions, objections, some of the people who are difficult and how to handle some of those things. We'll talk about, at least in my judgment, how some of those things can be dealt with. Not that I have the perfect answers, but that should be something to impel us to teach other people. We are the position of lepers that those four lepers were in. And we have a great feast in front of us, but it is ours to tell others. All right, any thoughts on 2 Kings 6? That's one of those uh, episodes that we don't remember uh, distinctly, perhaps. We haven't read it, perhaps, in a while. But anyway, the 2 Kings 6, Days of Jehoram. All right, now those are, those are some of the motivations from within. But let's talk about motivations now from without. We've had from above, from Christ, God. From within, we know that people need it. Let's talk about from around us. All right, what do we have? Do you know, <clears throat> we all wring our hands, I do, about what's happening in our country. We have, we have socialism, communism, Marxism that is absolutely running roughshod over everything, taking, taking everything that we know and hold dear in every institution of society. We have a lot of competition. And they, they are so motivated. Isn't it interesting? You, you think about this for a moment. From the time of Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt, they were both socialists. They, they, they basically wanted socialism. They wanted it to be in America. That's what they wanted. Lyndon Johnson, the great society, Basically, constitutionalists looked at this and said, this is nothing but socialism. Do you know when FDR promoted his New Deal program, do you know that nine Supreme Court justices said they are all unconstitutional. You can't do this by our Constitution. Every one of them said that. He's, well, he, well, he threatened the Supreme Court. He said, okay, this is what his power politics you talk about. He's, we're going to threaten the Supreme Court, and we're going to pack the Supreme Court, put other people in there. We'll get it done. And we, we knuckled under. And one person died, then another person died. He replaced them with New Dealers. Next thing you know, everything started passing, and, and we're in a socialistic state. And we've been going that way ever since. Now, the reason I mention that is not to get into political discussion, but to point out that socialists have had this in their mind for over 75 years, and they're still on the same track. Here's where we're going. Here's where we know we have been, and here's what we need to do to get America to go a socialistic nation. Isn't that something? It passes on from generation to generation, and, and they continue on. And in, in the meantime, we have a hard time staying with the program. But they don't. They don't. Marxists do not. They are still intergenerational, passing on their their goals to do what they need to do. So that's what's happening in, as far as my view is concerned. But the main point is Marxism, socialism, communism has been marching forward to the beat of a different drum and it passes on from generation to generation and they have one goal in mind and that is to bring America to its knees. And they continue on that. They pass the baton from one generation to the next. But we have a hard time in our own lives to stay with the program. 
As a matter of fact, it's hard, it's hard, it's difficult, it's a challenge that people would be even faithful to the church and the assembly of the church, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I did, no, I did not hear the program. I uh, appreciate a lot of things he says. You know, that's, but that's the point. The point simply is that they have a program and they've stayed with the program intergenerationally down the line. And we, and we have lost so many of our young people. We have a hard time staying faithful ourselves and being diligent about it. But it's amazing to think about. Just, just think about one particular issue. Just think about the global warming, the green energy issue. How long have they been on that track? You know? At least. At least since the inception of the United Nations. That's, that's been to have one trick in the bag, and that is to turn us to a totalitarian government, we're going to have to, we're going to have to and they have one trick, and that is to change things up. So in the United Nations, uh, one, of the, one, of the treat, one of the United Nations treaties is all about, we're going, we're going to change the behavior of every single person and every decision they make on the planet. And every decision, personal decision you make is going to have to be made in view of environmental concerns. Now that's, I think, okay, that, but that was written way back yonder. So how, they stay with that program. Now, whether you agree or disagree on the whole environmental thing, the point is that they stay with the program <laughs> over and over and over again, generation after generation. And that seems like, and they're so dedicated to it. I think, boy, if we had that dedication, <laughs> we, would, we would be doing great things. Yes, sir. Right. The Christian colleges are, you know, have bought into it, right? Right, right. Say again. Right, it, that's right. So, uh, so many years ago, when I was at Harding College, this was 70, um, 78, 79. <laughs> wow, that really, it's not in college in the 70s, okay. <laughs> so, um, George Benson, do you know George Benson's name? Anybody know George Benson's name? You know George Benson? Huh? I don't know any musician. <laughs> George, George Benson. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know about George Benson, <laughs> the musician. George Benson, the preacher. In the 1920s, he was, a, he was an evangelist to China. And so he came back to America, and he knew, having evangelized, you know George Benson's story. George Benson was an evangelist in China, and he had preached for several years over there, and he recognized, uh, as, as it turned communist in the 1940s, and he recognized what was, what was actually happening. And so when he came back to America, he, he was concerned about the onslaught of communism which is anti-God taking over America. And he began a program at Harding College called National Education Program. So George Benson and J.D. Bales and others were involved in it, and they were educating on the principles of the Bible against Marxism, environmentalism, socialism, communism, all of those things. And so it got to be so popular that, you know, Ronald Reagan even uh, even narrated one of the films that they put out. Ronald Reagan did. So it was so popular. George Benson's name was really a household name, especially in Arkansas. And consequently, uh, things began to roll forward, and it looked like, okay, we're going to stop some of this by educating. But since those times, they, those things have been put on the shelf, and now, as David points out, in, the, in our own Christian colleges, they have bought into some of these programs. I've I remember uh, several years ago, Nita and I worshipped at a congregation in, um, where was it? Sweetwater. In Sweetwater, and there was a professor from Abilene doing the preaching. And uh, he was, it was all about social justice, I thought. It's, it's social justice and how we need to have, you know, uh, plant a garden out, and uh, here's the work of the church, plant a garden out here and let everybody in the community come take some of the fruit of it. And that's, that's, our, that's our goal in Christ. Is, so everybody can that work and kind of work on your, your time that uh, you we're going to assign you times to work in the garden. And I thought, what? But anyway, so, but it was, he had a whole social justice lesson. That was a great thing social justice was. I thought, wait, 
That means a professor from Abilene. I thought, well, we are in, we're in trouble if this is what's going on. But, and I know it's been going on for a long time, having been through some of the colleges myself. So, at any rate, all of those things about uh, anti-God and, and educating people on those things have been set aside. But that is marching forward. Marxism is marching forward at a breathtaking pace in America, and we are sitting on our laurels so to speak, and we have a hard time evangelizing. We need to think about the competition we have out here. Now that's at an international level. When I read some of these international things, what's happening, I, like with the highway through the Dorian Gap the other day, I was reading, I, 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 we have lost, we've lost it all. I mean, this is amazing. But, but not only that, but we have competition at a local level too. What's the competition at a local level? Not even talking about communism. Denominationalism, denominations. They are busy gathering people, teaching false doctrine. And that's, that's a lot of competition. How do they do that? Entertainment, itching ears. I saw one right here the other day. Uh, I guess it was yesterday. We were driving by, was it yesterday? At when we were delivering meals up here on the highway, they had a great big circus going on outside of the church up there. And, you know, that's just, that's what they do. They have big bands come in. They have big circuses come in. And they have all these things and get people in there and get the kiddies involved in it. And next thing you know, they're going to be, we have a lot of competition. And people are very undiscerning frequently about what is being taught, what is actually being said. I find that to be the case, don't you? Someone goes to, here's a preacher, and okay, I say, well, they come in. Well, he was a great speaker. I said, what did he say? Well, well it was just it was really good. I said, well, what, what did he say? How do you become a Christian? Well, I didn't catch that. I said, what? I've talked to some people like that, and I says, do you know what? I heard it too, and he said very plainly, all you have to do is believe. Just say this prayer in your heart, and everything's going to be fine. Why, what do you, how is it that we're not discerning enough to pick up those things? I don't understand. But that's how, that's how competition rages at, an, at a local level. Yes, sir. Well, and the point simply is that, that they've watered down doctrinal emphases completely. They don't have any, as SF, we don't have to be right doctrinally at all. And that, is, that to me is very frightening that people are so undiscerning about that, that here's what's being taught. And so I, I even, I've you've given this illustration before, but I was talking with a young man about the plan of salvation, and he had been in the Baptist church for 25 years, I guess 25. And if I, you've heard the story already, I'm, I apologize, but I told him, I said, you know what? I said, Baptists believe that you have to repent before you can believe. He said, oh, no, you don't. No, no. What do you mean? I, he, I said, I said, that's impossible, right? He said, that's impossible. You, you can't repent before you even believe in God. I said, I know. But the Baptists put repentance first. He, no, 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 I never heard of that. Uh, that's not true. I said, well, all right. So I went to my little five-finger exercise. I said, okay, we hear, believe, repent. I said, you tell me where you're saved. You tell me where you're saved. You hear the gospel, then you believe. Okay, right there, right there, believe. I said, okay, but we haven't even gotten to repentance yet. I said, so if you're saved here and you have to repent, how is it that you're saved when you believe, but you have to repent later? How does that work? That's exactly what the answer was. Well, 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 I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have, I said, well, I'll tell you how they do it. They take repentance and put it in front of belief. That's how they do it. Oh, I, I can't believe that. I can't. I, I said, well, then you don't have to repent because if you're saved here, then repentance has nothing to do with it. Well, but his preacher came in and, I, and he confirmed what I was saying. I said, but he said, I've never heard this before. And this preacher said, I've been preaching for 25 years. <laughs> and he, but the point is, people are not very discerning what is actually being said. And I find that to be the case among our own number two. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be too critical of denominationalism in the pulpits because we, are, we tend to drift in that direction too. What is being actually said? What does Bill say? What does whoever is up in the pulpit, what does he teach? Randy. 
I saw her hand. I was just ignoring her. <laughs> Go ahead, Ann. Have I gotten an invitation? No. She asked if I got an invitation to go to the Church of God on Easter Sunday. No. No, I have not. Oh, well, okay. She said, just write your name down somewhere and then... Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yeah. Let's look at one passage as we conclude. That's from the Old Testament again, Ezekiel 33. 7 through 9. So I'll let one of you who has that text, since I don't have my Ezekiel with me, I think it starts, Son of Man. That is a very powerful text, isn't it? It tells us our responsibility is to speak the word, or at least spread the word however we can do it. You can hand someone a tract. Your responsibility is to do that. And if you do that, then the blood is not required at your hands, but it is so sad. And in the case of Ezekiel, it was disobedient to God to not speak when God says, I have said, you shall die in your iniquity, and you don't warn people. Then their blood I'll require at your hand. But if you speak to warn and they reject it, then you've delivered your soul. They will, they will still die in their iniquity, but you delivered your soul. And that really speaks to us, doesn't it? Our responsibility is to speak the word of God. Is there any prophet in the Old Testament that was a popular individual? No. They were all unpopular. Yeah, but they were all they all faced death. They all faced death. They all were persecuted, every one of them. So they were just, you know, they, we just don't have the comfort in okay, I'm going to be popular with everybody. So it just it should encourage me that my duty to speak to the Speak the word to someone. And we need to be about that of Father's business. So it, we have motivation from above, from within, and from around us. All right. Anything else to add? Yes, sir, Dan. That's all right. Now, you don't have to be quick. Yeah, he did. You know, Moses disobeyed God upon that occasion, Numbers 20. And he didn't pay attention to the authority of God on that occasion. That's, that's, that's right. And so it should teach us not to run from authority because that's... That's really what it's all about, isn't it? All right, thank you for your participation and your comments.